Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 6 of GPU Computing. Uh, today, we'll be talking about uh, some more performance considerations. We've spoken about performance quite a bit in uh, some of the past lectures, uh, and today we'll kind of uh, uh, speak about a few more performance considerations um, before we kind of proceed to start talking about other things in the course, like, uh, uh, like um, uh, different parallel patterns. Uh, so last time uh, we looked at memory in the GPU architecture and the CUDA programming model, and we saw how we can optimize memory accesses using shared memory tiling, and we applied this uh, to an example application. In particular, it was matrix matrix multiplication. So we said that um, different processors have, uh, you know, processor designers uh, tell us uh, about the performance of their processors using various metrics like the peak flop rate and the peak memory bandwidth how many floating point operations per second a processor can do uh, and how many bytes per second the memory of that processor can supply that processor. And we saw how these things varied across architectures. Uh, and we also saw uh, that applications can be compute bound or memory bound depending on whether they hit the peak flops rate or the peak memory bandwidth first. Uh, and we said that the peak flops rate in current processors tends to be pretty far ahead of the memory bandwidth. Uh, and what that means is that on the Volta V100, for example, uh, I would need 15.6 operations per byte. That's around 60 something operations uh, per uh, floating point, floating point 60, something operation, 60 something operations per floating point value that I load in order for me to reach a balance between the peak flow upstairs and the peak memory bandwidth. Uh, so anything that uses does fewer than that is expected to be compute uh, memory bound versus if you're doing more com more computations than that, then you're expected to be compute bound. Uh, and we did this exercise for various uh, uh, various kernels. Uh, we looked at the matrix multiplication kernel and we saw how we wrote it before. Uh, we were doing uh, two floating point operations for every eight bytes that we load. So the two floating point operations are the addition and the multiplication. And the eight bytes are the four bytes from A and the four bytes from B. And that gave us a 0 0.25 ops per byte compute to global memory access ratio. Uh, but we saw how what we actually want to fully utilize the Volta V100 is something like 60, 60, like 15.6 operations per byte or 60 uh, operations per operand. Uh, and uh, that is way higher than this. So we looked, we considered how can we improve uh, this uh, compute to memory access ratio. And we said that one way we can do it uh, is by using uh, shared memory. So we saw that in the GPU architecture, we have the global memory, but we also have, uh, we have caches, but the caches are managed by the hardware. However, we have this shared memory that sits on the SM that's much faster than the global memory, but it's much smaller, of course. And we said that for data that we access multiple times, what we could do is we could have one thread loaded from the global memory to the shared memory and then have multiple threads access it from the shared memory. So we saw how in the CUDA programming model, uh, we have every thread has its own private registers. All threads in the grid have access to the same global memory, but we also saw that threads in the same thread block have access to the shared memory. And this allows threads in the same thread block to collaborate with each other in order for, for them to minimize global memory accesses and reuse data from shared memory. Uh, we then looked at how we can apply this to matrix matrix multiplication. We observed that in matrix matrix multiplication, uh, threads in the same thread block, so for example, the threads that process these four output elements, all share the same uh, all share the same input row from A. And, they, and also we saw how threads in the same thread block, for example, these four threads that act, that process these four values, all share the uh, load the same uh, column. So rather than having these threads, each one load the, the row from A or the column from B from global memory, what we could do is we could have all the thread, we could think of our A and B input matrices as also being tiled uh, or divided into tiles. And we can have the threads inside of this thread block, each one be responsible for loading one of the elements of A and one of the elements of B. So for example, this thread, would be responsible for loading this element in A and this element in B. Uh, this thread over here would be res uh, responsible for loading this element from A uh, and this element from B. Uh, and then they would all load a tile to shared memory. Each thread is responsible for loading one element of that tile. 
uh, and then the threads would uh, do, would uh, do the partial dot product from the tile. So this thread would be responsible for loading this element and this element. However, it'll it'll take advantage of re of doing the dot product of all the elements in this row uh, or partial row and all the elements in this partial column by accessing shared memory instead of global memory. Uh, and then we can do the same thing for the next tile uh, and the same thing from the for the next tile. Uh, and and we uh, implemented the code for this, and we ran it, and we sh showed how it gave us significantly better performance. Okay, we then uh, looked at uh, boundary conditions, and we said that one thing we have to be careful about in boundary conditions is that uh, and, and when without tiling, you know, we just took out all the uh, threads that that are outside of bounds of the output, uh, and and we only computed with the ones that are within bounds. But here we have to be careful because. Uh, over here, the thread block that's processing this output tile, right? Even it has some threads that are processing values that are within bounds and some threads that don't process any output values. But these threads that don't process any output values may still participate in loading the input. So for example, uh, if this corresponds to the threads inside of this thread block, uh, and we want to load this tile of A and this tile of B, uh, we'll notice that these threads are going to be active when we load this tile of A. Uh, these threads are going to be active when we load the, this, tile of, this tile of B, uh, but then only these threads are going to be active when we compute uh, and when we store. So this is something that we have to be careful about. And this goes back to, to the rule of thumb that we said before, uh, which is that uh, uh, when you, when you want to reason about uh, boundary conditions, every memory access needs to have a corresponding boundary condition. So the memory access that loads the input tile of A has its own boundary condition, the memory access that loads the input tile of B has its own boundary condition, and the memory access that stores the output value of C is going to have its own boundary condition. So this is the best way to reason about boundary conditions. Uh, and then finally, we said that shared memory and also register usage impact occupancy because we only have a limited amount of shared memory per SM. So how much shared memory we request uh, for our thread block uh, will impact our occupancy. So we can't just say that we want all the shared memory in the world uh, because there's a limited amount of shared memory on the SM. Okay, so this was a quick overview of what we covered last time. Any questions? Yes, Professor. Yes. Um, just one question. It's uh, So uh, if we're limited by memory, why don't they provide CPUs with, uh, GPUs with less cores and sell it for cheaper? Because not all your your applications are limited by memory. Some of them are are limited are not limited by memory. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, so a GPU is designed for many kinds of applications. Some of them are memory bound. Some of them are not. Now, if you have an application that's extremely limited by memory, then uh, then you know there's there's other you might want to consider other types of processors. So there's research on processors like. Uh, that, that do things like processing and memory, uh, and that's uh, designed for memory-bound applications. But this is this is a very kind of research-level stuff. It's not something that is, that's in wide production. Okay, but GPUs are they're they're good at applications for that are that have you know a memory bottleneck because the the HBM in the GPU gives you high memory bandwidth. Uh, but of course, uh, what the more compute-bound an application is, the the better you'll find the GPU is at uh, accelerating. Uh, professor, what happens if we we need more shared memory than 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 we have, and then we run the code? Does it does it can it detect it? You mean if you request? If I yeah, like maybe I need one hundred kilobytes, and there's only ninety six. Does it give me an error or something? So if you if you request, uh, so there's two ways to request shared memory, like we saw last time. You can statically allocate the shared memory, so you specify the size of the array. Uh, using a compile time constant, or you can dynamically allocate it by configuring the kernel. If you statically allocate more shared memory than the SM has, the code will fail to compile. Uh, if you are dynamically allocating memory and you dynamically try to allocate more shared memory than the uh, than the the SM has, uh, then in this case the kernel will fail to launch. Professor, continuing on that, for example, if my application crashes, uh, I have a, a bug or problem in the code um, does the memory gets the, uh, get, does the memory is there a memory leak or, or no 
So it is, it, it, there, it, you can think of it just like the CPU memory. So if an application crashes, uh, the operating system kind of uh, like, you know, deallocates all the memory that was allocated by that application. Similarly, if a process crashes, then all the GPU memory that it had allocated will be deallocated. So you don't have to worry about mem memory leaks in case of a crash. Obviously, you do have to worry about memory leaks if you're if you're if you don't have a crash, but you allocate and forget to deallocate and are still running the application. But of course, if memory leaks and then the application stops running, uh, then everything it had allocated will be free. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so uh, if there are no further questions, then today we will uh, re look a little bit about the D uh, at the DRAM architecture, how the DRAM uh, is organized. Uh, and after reviewing some DRAM ar architecture is going to motivate uh, an optimization that we're going to talk about. And we're, we'll also talk about another performance optimization that comes up frequently. Okay, and performance optimizations in general. So performance optimizations. Uh, we've uh, seen several performance optimizations so far. Uh, we've looked at the importance of tuning our resource res resource usage to maximize occupancy. So this is one important optimization. Uh, we've looked at the importance of minimizing control divergence to increase our SIMD efficiency. Uh, we actually didn't do an example of this. We just uh, talked about the, you know, we observed that control divergence exists and we observed that it is a source of inefficiency and we observed that it is important to minimize it. But we didn't do an example of how to do so and we will do examples, multiple examples later on in the course on minimizing control divergence. Uh, but it is an optimization that we have we have alluded to. Uh, we also saw shared memory tiling to increase data reuse. So where, whenever we have data that is reused by multiple threads, uh, we can use shared memory to load it once and then have all the threads access it from shared memory. Uh, we're going to talk about two more optimizations today. The first one is memory coalescing, uh, which we have actually been doing, uh, but we just didn't talk about it. Uh, and then the second one is thread coarsening, which we will do an example of today. Uh, so before, I'll, I'll start by talking about memory coalescing, but before that, I would like to talk a little bit about the DRAM architecture. Uh, so a DRAM cell, uh, for those of you who've taken a course in computer architecture, you should be familiar with this, but I will uh, review it. A DRAM cell, you can logically think of it as some capacitance that stores a charge and some three state device uh, where when you enable it, the capacitor discharges uh, in order for you to read that value. Uh, and and it, so if the value is one, it'll discharge and you'll detect that there's a discharge. If the value is zero, it won't discharge and you'll detect that there's no discharge. So uh, you will know that it's a zero. Okay, uh, so a DRAM uh, cell consists of capacitance that stores charge and a three state device that allows the data to be read uh, and written. Okay. Uh, a DRAM array uh, looks like this. Uh, you have uh, multiple uh, DRAM cells connected to a column wire, okay? Uh, and at any point in time, because all of these are connected to a wire, at any point in time, you will only read one of these cells. All right? Uh, and uh, a DRAM bank is going to consist of multiple of these uh, vertical wires connected, you know, these DRAM cells all connected to a wire. So you're going to have multiple of these, okay? So a DRAM a bank consists of this 2D array of DRAM cells. And at any point in time, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to activate one row uh, in this DRAM cell, in, in this DRAM array, in order to read that row. So for example, uh, we have these lines that activate our uh, three state buffers. If I set this line to one and all the others to zero, what will happen is these three state devices will will uh, will uh, will they open, meaning you close the circuit, uh, and then the, these capacitors will discharge and we read uh, these rows. Okay. Uh, if I activate this set this row to one and then all the others to zero, then these three capacitors or this row of capacitors will discharge. Uh, and we are going to read one bit from each column. Okay, so this is how DRAM works. Now, those of you who know, know that when we read, we destroy the value, so we have to write it back, and this makes DRAM slow. Uh, and, you know, yes, this is all part of how DRAM works, but the key thing is that we read, we read uh, one row at a time 
uh, and uh, and this read involves discharging these capacities. Uh, so in general, if the DRAM bank is architected as follows, we provide a row address to a row decoder. The row, what does the row decoder do? The row decoder takes this address, determines which row we want, uh, and then sets one of these outputs to one and the others to zero. Uh, and then we pass this decoded signal to the DRAM bank. Uh, and uh, in the DRAM bank, what happens is if we activate this row, all the cells in this row are going to discharge. Uh, and what we do is they will cut the values will come out uh, over here. Uh, uh, these values will feed into a sense amplifier. The sense amplifier is uh, are these circuits that will the circuit components that will detect the change in charge in the capacitors in order for them to figure out whether the capacitor has a one or a zero. Uh, and then after detecting this, uh, this uh, change in charge, we store it to a column latch. Uh, now a column latch uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, it holds onto the value. So when you read it, it doesn't get destroyed. So what happens is that this column latch will then be used to write back the value that we read because reading from a capacitor destroys the value. Uh, and then this column latch will hold on to the value that we read from the DRAM row. Uh, and then the, and then, but, but the row is large, right? So the row is larger than a typical uh, size of your request. Uh, so what happens is the address also has another part, which is the column address. So your whole memory address is divided into parts. Part of it is the row address. Another part is the column address. The column address will be passed to a multiplexer uh, to select what, uh, what part of this row uh, uh, my, my address corresponds to. Uh, and, uh, and then this multiplexer will select that part and provide it as the data that I am requesting. Okay. Uh, now this entire row that I read, Okay, I'm not, that's not, I don't pass the entire row. I just pass part of it, but this entire row that I read is called a burst. So this is a DRAM burst. Okay, now what, what part of this whole process is, is the slowest part? The box? The DRAM array, because it's huge. The DRAM array, the sense amplifiers, these take time, right? The MUX is actually not, not that fast, not that slow. Okay, so relatively, this, this, uh, this uh, stage of reading from the DRAM array and sense uh, doing, going through the sense amplifiers and then storing in the column latch and then writing back the value that we destroyed, this is the slow part. The fast part is uh, using the MUX to select what part of the row we want. Okay. So this is the slow part. The faster part is uh, now that we have the whole burst, selecting what part of the burst we care about. Uh, professor? Yes. Uh, in 255, I remember uh, you said something about the decoder. We can't make it big enough, uh, big enough become, because it becomes too slow or something like that. Right, exactly. And that is why this is just a DRAM bank. It's not my entire DRAM. Oh, okay. So I'm not, this is a, this, this DRAM array is not going to have, uh, you know, four gigabytes worth of row. Okay, it's going to have, it's going to be, it's going to have a small, small amount, and I'm going to have multiple DRAM banks, and I'll talk about that later on. Okay, so let's do an example just to make this clear. Uh, so if I have this address over here, I want to read uh, the value at address zero one zero. Okay, and I have this uh, this DRAM array that is four by four. Well, what happens in this case is I'm going to divide my address into a row address and a column address. Okay, so let's say I use zero one as my row address. Okay, zero one goes through the decoder. Uh, each one of these four inputs corresponds to one row address. So zero, 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 one, uh, one, zero, one, one. Oops, uh, maybe this should have been one, zero. Oh, well, oh, or maybe we're going from down. So zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. So the point is that I use this address to activate one row, uh, and then I read this row, I read the entire burst into my MUX, okay? And then I now I wanna select uh, which part of this entire burst I want, and for that, I'm gonna use this zero uh, as my column address, okay? And then this zero uh, will select, uh, will select uh, this, this, uh, this part of the data that I read and provide it to uh, to my uh, to my processor, okay.
So I'm going to use the other part of the address to select columns within a row. Now, if my next access is something like 100, zero, then I have to do this entire process again, right? I have to go back, pass the one zero, decode it, read the corresponding row, and then, and then, and then use the multiplexer. But if my next address that I read happened to be 0, 1, 1, do I have to go back and read the whole, uh, do, go through the decoder and the DRM array again? Oh. No, no okay. right. What, 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 do I, what, what do I have to do in this case? Change, uh, go to the multiplexer. The multiplexer. Right, I just have to change, I I, the only thing that changes is what the multiplexer is doing. So if my next address is 011, right? So if the other access comes from the same burst, then there's no need to read the row again from DRAM. I can just change the multiplexer. And this is why this idea of DRAM bursts is important. In general, accessing data in different bursts uh, means that we need to access the array again. Uh, so in terms of time, and accessing the array is the part that takes long, the multiplexer doesn't take much time. So if I have I'm accessing data in different bursts, then I have all this time I need to wait to access the array, and then this read part is the multiplexer part to access the data from it within the burst. And then if I go and access data from a different burst, I have to wait again until I read the entire array, and then I get my data from my burst. However, if I access data in the same burst, then in this case, I don't need to access the array again. I ju just need to change the multiplexer. So in this case, my timeline looks like this. I do the, I, I read the entire row, I read the entire burst, and then I, I, I provide the data from the burst, and then if the next access comes from the same burst, I also pro I just provide that same access without me having to uh, re-go through, through the DRAM again. But don't you have, still have the same clock time? Sorry? Doesn't it depend on the clock? So, uh... Every time you read, uh, it's a clock tick. So... I mean, of course, there's some notion of clocks there, uh, clocks involved here. I don't want to get into that. Uh, but uh, the, the time that it takes uh, for me to change uh, the max to get the, another part of the burst is much less than the time, uh, or there's much clock, fewer clock cycles to do that than the clock cycles I need to wait in order for me to do this whole sense amplification and this whole read for the DRM. Okay, so the moral of the story is accessing data in the same burst is faster than accessing data in different bursts. Okay, and what this does is it brings me to the point about memory coalescing. So when the same warp access consecutive memory locations in the same burst, okay, so if I have threads that are in the same warp, uh, reading consecutive data in an array, that data will likely be in the same DRAM burst. These accesses can be combined and served by one DRAM burst. So that means that one DRAM transaction is needed, right? And this is known as memory coalescing. I coalesce the memory accesses from the different threads into one memory access. However, if threads same warp access locations that are not in the same burst, then these access cannot be combined. And what that means is I need to make multiple transactions. So it's going to take long. And remember that uh, uh, when threads are in the same warp, I need to wait for all, the, they all execute together. So if threads in the same warp all issue a memory uh, load instruction, right? They try to load from memory. I need to wait for all the load instructions to complete before I can execute that warp because all the threads need to have their data ready. So if all of those loads be touching the same uh, DRAM burst, we coalesce them and that's one memory access. Uh, but if uh, these the threads in the same warp are accessing different locations in DRAM, then I need to wait for all those uh, uh, loads to be served by the DRAM before the warp can continue executing, okay? And what happens here is this is called, sometimes people call this memory divergence. So control divergence is when threads in the same warp diverge from control paths. Each one of them wants to execute one branch or an if, of an if statement uh, or, or, or a different number of loop iterations. Memory divergence is when threads in the same warp try access data in different uh, DRAM bursts. 
each one of them is going to uh, is going to ha have to issue a separate load. I cannot combine their loads. Okay, uh, and we've actually been adhering to memory coalescing quite well so far, just because it was so easy to do that in the applications that we've looked at so far. So let's go back and see the code that we wrote. So here in our vector addition code, in our vector addition code. When you look at what threads in the same warp are accessing, are threads in the same warp likely to access uh, data in the same DRM burst? Uh, no. Why not? Uh, because it's different row each time. Okay, well, th think about it. So if, if here I have thread zero, and thread one and thread two are accessing the array X. They're going to issue a, each, they're, they're going to issue load instructions to access the array X. Well, thread zero is going to access X of zero, and thread one is going to access X of one, and thread two is going to access X of two, right? Are X of zero and X of one and X of two likely to be in the same DRAM burst? Yes. When you say, when you say, but the, aren't the cells arranged by uh, eight bits? Oh no no no. Okay, that's a good point. I forgot to mention. This. So it, the typical size of a DRAM row, of a row in a DRAM bank is not going to be eight bits. It's going to be something pretty large. Okay okay. I see. So it's going to have many. It's going to have many many bytes. Okay. So that's that's a good point. So having having cleared that up, it's obvious that uh, in this case I have memory coalescing because threads zero to thirty one are going to access elements zero to thirty one in X of I. Uh, so uh, they, these elements uh, zero to thirty one are all like are all nearby each other in memory. So they're likely going to be within the same DRAM burst, which means that I can coalesce these accesses. Okay. Similarly with matrix matrix multiplication. Right? What about matrix matrix multiplication? Are my accesses here coalesced? Be careful here. Uh, the I, 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 one thing I should clarify is that when I have a two-dimensional thread block, what I do is I put all the threads in the x dimension together in a warp before going down the y dimension. Okay. So here, uh, the, what determines if something is uh, the consecutive threads in the warp are going to be the threads with consecutive thread index dot x value. Okay, so threads access with threads with the consecutive thread index dot x values are going to be in the same warp. In other words, threads with the same row index and consecutive column index values are going to be in the same warp. So here, if I look at the access to B, right, it's obviously going to be coalesced because all threads have the same value of i and all threads have the same value of n, okay? And threads in the same warp have consecutive values of call. So then threads in the same warp will access consecutive values of b. So obviously the access to b is going to be coalesced. Okay? What about the access of a? It's the same. It, it's uh, like the same. Right. It's, it's the same for all threads in the warp, exactly. Assume, assuming that all my threads are have the same value of rows. So if I have a 32 by 32 thread block, all threads will have the same row value. So here, all threads in the warp have the same row, the same n, and the same i. So they're not. It's 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 you know they're all accessing the same exact memory location. So I don't have to worry there either. Okay. So uh, just here, I was noting that warp uh, uh, warp contains consecutive threads in the x dimension. Uh, so See that access to A and B are coalesced because threads 0 to 31 access uh, um, access consecutive uh, access the same element of A and then consecutive elements of B. Uh, what about matrix tiled matrix matrix multiplication? It was my, were my accesses here coalesced? To a lesser extent. Why is it to a lesser extent? Because we load, um, uh, like we use shared memory, which is good. But in general, when we load, we, we're loading only tiles, maybe. And so. Right. So we care about going to global memory. So here, when I'm loading from global memory, are threads in a, in a warp accessing consecutive elements? Well, they all have the same value for row, same value for n, same value for tile. Tile dim is a constant. 
So the threads in the same warp are going to be access, are going to have consecutive thread index.x values. So they will also access consecutive elements. Okay. Same thing here. Call is in terms of thread index.x. So here, uh, they, these will also be uh, coalesced. So yes, actually, it turns out that these are uh, both going to be coalesced. Okay. So access to A and B are coalesced. Uh, now, so far, all the examples we've had uh, are actually been fairly coalesced. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, you know, talk about this today just to clarify, uh, to, to, you know, clarify what was going on underneath. If our accesses were not going, were not coalesced, we would have seen a significant blow to our performance. Uh, and later on, we will look at examples uh, where we would will have an application where we start off with something that's not coalesced and see how we can change it in order to make sure that our accesses are coalesced. Can you repeat why elements in the th uh, like threads in this uh, access this access uh, the access are co coalesced for the row? Because thread thread index at the thread if we have thread index dot y, we're going to access different rows of of the errors of the matrix. So doesn't it depend on the row size of the DRAM? Uh, can you can you say that again? You mean threads that have the same row but different column values? Why are they coalesced? Yes. Okay, because uh, the the way that the way that warps are organized. Uh, is that you have thread, so threads uh, with uh, with the same y value, but consecutive x values will go into the same warp. Okay, so for example, uh, th the thread with y equals zero and x equals zero is going to be in the same warp as the thread with y equals zero and x equals one, and then y equals zero and x equals two, y equals zero and x equals three. Once I'm once I've I'm I have hit the uh, the block dim dot x of the thread block. Uh, that's when I start taking threads from the next row of the of the block. Uh, so thread index dot y equals one, thread index dot x equals zero, and putting them in my warp. Now, in, if I have a thirty-two by thirty-two thread block, uh, then uh, in that thirty-two by thirty-two thread block, uh, the threads with thread index dot y equals zero and thread index dot x going from zero to thirty-one, those are going to be the first warp. And then the mm -hmm. threads with thread index.y equals one and thread index.x is going from zero to 31. Those are going to be the second word, et cetera. Okay, okay, got it. Thank you. So this uh, this had this uh, covers the topic of memory coalescing. Okay. Uh, uh, another thing I would like to talk about uh, is the fact that we have multiple DRAM banks. So usually uh, when we organize DRAM, we don't just have one big DRAM array. For multiple reasons, the first reason is that manufacturing a huge DRAM array is, is you know, is not feasible. But then another reason is that when we have multiple uh, DRAM banks, uh, this allows us to have uh, parallelism when we access our DRAM. And let me show you what I mean by that. So when when D, when I have uh, DRAM is organized into multiple banks, and all these banks kind of feed data on the same bus. So when I read uh, from DRAM, I usually read from one of these DRAM arrays at a time, or maybe multiple, depending on my DRAM architecture. But the idea is that uh, ha when I have multiple DRAM arrays, uh, one, one DRAM array may be serving me while another DRAM array is in the middle of uh, finding an operation, finding a da data that we requested from it. Uh, and the, having multiple DRAM arrays is useful because uh, it allows us to do latency hiding, okay, if of our memory accesses, okay. So multiple DRAM banks allow us to do latency hiding, and let's see what I mean by that. Uh, so if I have one DRAM bank, then even if I fully utilize my burst, there's always this time that I'm waiting for my burst to be to be read from the DRAM array, and then I have the time that I spend accessing data in that burst. But once I've used all that data in my burst. I still have to go and read the next uh, data in my DRM array before I can access that data from the latch. Okay, so even if I fully utilize my DRAM burst, I still have this time that I'm wasting waiting for my DRAM array to read the data. Now, if I have multiple DRAM banks, then what I can do uh, is, uh, is you know, I, I, I have this time that I waited for my DRAM burst to come, but then 
Uh, as I am reading my, uh, when I finish reading my DRAM burst, I, I still have these other DRAM arrays, uh, uh, you know, reading from uh, being read in the other banks. Okay, they can think of each of these horizontal lines as the timeline for one of the banks. Okay, and then uh, when I'm done reading the, the burst uh, for from this bank, another bank might be ready. Uh, so in this case, now I can read the data from the second bank. Okay. And then by the time I finish reading from the second bank, the burst in the third bank is ready. So I can go and I can read the data uh, from uh, from the third bank. And then the time that I'm reading the bursts from the second bank and the third bank and serving them to the chip, uh, the first bank is going and it's doing another DRAM array read. And by the time I've, I've read from my other DRAM banks, uh, now the burst in my first DRAM bank has arrived. So having multiple DRAM banks available to me enables me to hide the latency of these DRAM banks because as I'm reading the burst from one bank, the other banks are going and they are reading other data. Okay, uh, so just so this, so here we're hiding the latency of memory by, 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 ha by having many DRAM banks to always ensure, you know, the more DRAM banks we have, uh, the, you know, the higher chance we have that one of these DRAM banks has finished its memory access and is ready to serve me in person. Okay. However, in order for me to effectively utilize these DRAM banks, what do I need to have? Okay. If I need, if I have, if I want to have many memory banks reading data at the same time in order for me to overlap, to, to hide their latencies, I need to give them a lot of memory accesses to service. Right. And for me to give them many memory accesses, what do I need? I need many threads running simultaneously and requesting data simultaneously so that I can keep my DRAM banks busy. Okay, and what does this remind you of? Scheduling warps. Warps, what about warps? It's all divergence or no? no. It wasn't divergence, it was another thing about warps. Now there's uh, we move warps in and out. Right, exactly. So we like to have many more warps running on our SM than uh, than than or scheduled on our SM than SM can simultaneously execute, so that when when one of them is is waiting, the other one is ready to service. Similarly, we want to have many me more memory accesses then we can simultaneously read from our DRAM so that while we're reading one access from one of the banks uh, or while we're waiting for one access to complete from one of the banks and uh, we're another one is completing uh, in the bank. And the way we achieve this is by is using the same technique, having high occupancy. So by having high occupancy in our SMs, this both helps us hide the latency of hide the pipeline latency in the core but these, these many threads having this high occupancy also ensures that we have many memory accesses in order for us to be able to hide the memory access latency when accessing DRAM. Is this clear? Any questions? Okay. So, uh, so two, so one optimization we spoke about today uh, is memory coalescing and ensuring that our memory accesses are 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 coalesced. Uh, and then we also reviewed this idea of occupancy, but this time applied. We showed how having high occupancy not only helps us hide uh, latency in our pipeline, but also hide latency when accessing memory. Uh, then for the second half of the lecture, what I'd like to talk about is a a another optimization. Uh, and that is thread coarsening. And, with, and for that, uh, I, I want to start to introduce this idea of thread granularity. So, so far, uh, the parallelization approaches that we've been using uh, to parallelize these different applications, uh, we've fo been following the strategy of making threads as fine grain as possible. What do I mean by threads being as fine grain as possible? I mean that we're assigning threads to the smallest possible unit of, par uh, of parallelism. So, for example, uh, in, uh, when I did vector addition, I had every thread responsible for one vector element, not two. The smallest possible unit of parallelism uh, is one vector element, adding 
one vector element to one vector element and producing one vector element. So we had one thread do that. Uh, similarly, when we did the RGB to gray, we assigned a thread to every output pixel. And similarly, with matrix matrix multiplication, we assigned a thread for every element in the output matrix. Okay, so we've been making threads as fine grain as possible. So this is what we mean by the granularity of a thread. You know how small or how large the task that we gave it is with respect to what are what are all the tasks that can be parallelized. Now, what is the advantage of making threads as fine grain as possible? What is what is the advantage of making threads as small as possible unit of parallelism? We take advantage of all the cores we have. Right, we take advantage of all the cores we have. So we, we extract as much parallelism as possible from our program. Okay, so uh, the advantage of having fine grain thread granularity is that it provides the hardware with, with as many threads as possible to fully utilize the resources. Now, what happens if we if we provide hardware with all these threads, but the hardware actually less has less resources? Uh, than these threads, than, than what, what are the threads that we gave it. What does the hardware do? We wait. Right, they wait and uh, they wait until uh, there are resources for them to execute. So if there are more threads provided uh, than the GPU can support, then the hardware can serialize this work with low overhead. Uh, but uh, the, if, if I did not provide it with all the parallelism I had, if I provided it with less parallelism, uh, the problem is that if I have a future device that has more that has more resources, uh, then it won't be able to extract more parallelism. But by providing it all the parallelism that's available in my program, in the future, if I get a new GPU that comes out and that GPU has more resources, uh, then the then the the hardware can easily extract more parallelism without me having to rewrite the code. And remember, we gave this a name. We call this transparent scalability. This idea that if I have less resources, I, uh, the hardware serializes the threads for me, and if I have more resources, then the hardware can parallelize the threads. So giving the hardware as many threads as possible gives it the flexibility uh, to parallelize them if it, if it has enough resources or serialize them if it does. Now, what is the disadvantage? Is there a disadvantage to this? Is there a disadvantage of me uh, giving the hardware as many threads as possible? So we don't take it over uh, operation per byte ratio. Sorry, say that again. So we don't take advantage of coalescence. I said lower operation byte ratio. A lower operation per uh, byte ratio. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that. It, it, it actually it could be that. Um, but the, remember, when we calculated operations level right so every thread was doing a certain number of operations per byte so if i have more threads each will, each of them is going to do more operations would also load more data so it's uh you know the operation, the operation doesn't get affected directly but but we will see actually today how it can be affected indirectly so so if, if, the, thread rules, sorry, if the thread does way too little work wouldn't the overhead become very significant uh, so again, we said that uh, the hardware actually can uh, can uh, can uh, schedule these threads with very low overhead. The hardware is pretty good at that. Uh, the the disadvantage actually uh, it's something you guys are kind of alluding to, which is that if there are common operations that are performed redundantly across threads, okay, uh, when I run these threads in parallel, that's okay. Okay, because that the, that redundancy is a price that I'm paying to get parallelism. Okay, but if so, it's okay if the threads are actually running in parallel. But if the threads are actually going to be running sequentially, so if I if I have this redundancy across threads, right? So there's an operation that I that that performed redundantly across threads. Okay, if these threads are actually going to end up being serialized by the hardware, then this is suboptimal because I'm paying this redundancy in order for me to get parallelism, but then I'm losing, uh, I'm not I'm not getting that parallelism because the hardware is serializing the work anyways. Okay, so let me uh, give an example of what I mean by that. So here, if you remember with our tiled matrix matrix multiplication, uh, what we had is we had every thread block 
responsible for a tile in the output matrix. Okay, and the threads, each thread in that thread block was responsible for one element inside of this output matrix. Uh, and these threads collaborated to load uh, input tiles. Okay. Now, if you'll notice, uh, what you'll see is that these two thread blocks that are horizontally adjacent to each other, okay, these thread blocks load different tiles of B, but they load the same tile of A, okay? So thread blocks processing horizontally adjacent output tiles redundantly load the same tile of A. So here, this thread block is gonna go on some SM and load this tile of A. And this thread block is going to go maybe on the same SM or maybe on a different SM, and it's also going to load that same tile of A. Okay, so this uh, loading of, uh, of uh, having both threads load, uh, both thread blocks load A is redundant. Now, if these two thread blocks are actually running on parallel on different SMs and loading A at the same time, then that's okay because this redundancy is a, is a price that I paid in order for me to be able to compute these output tiles in parallel. However, if my hardware actually ends up, if I get my hardware too many thread blocks and my hardware actually ends up serializing these two thread blocks, then what's gonna happen is that this thread block is gonna run, it's gonna load this tile of A and then load this tile of B and compute this, uh, this part. And then much later, this other thread block is gonna come and it's gonna load this tile of A and load this other tile of B and compute the output. So in this case, if, if my hardware is going to serialize it, uh, is there a benefit for me to serialize it instead in the code? Yes, I save like loading the tile twice, but then I have to make sure it fits in the shared memory. Right, exactly. So if, if uh, one optimization that we could do, if we know that we're, we're providing the hardware with too many thread blocks and it can run at the same time, what we can do is rather than load this A redundantly for these two output blocks, uh, we can assign one thread block to be responsible for this output block and this output block. And we can have this thread block first load this block and this block and compute the partial tile. And then before proceeding, it can go and it can, using the same tile of A, load this thread block and compute uh, this, partial out, this partial output tile. So we can have one thread block process multiple output tiles sequentially and reuse uh, the input tile that it loaded. Okay, so this is uh, an advantage of, uh, uh, this is an advantage of thread coarsening. Uh, if 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 these two the thread blocks uh, processing these two tiles were actually running in parallel, great redundancy is worth it. But if they're going to get sequentialized, then I prefer to get rid of this redundancy and load A only once and use it for both of these output tiles. Okay, is that clear? Any questions about this? So okay, the fact that, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Uh, does that depend on uh, the number of cores and the GPU in your hardware? Will uh... yes, of course it does. Of course it does. So whether or not uh, these the two thread blocks here will be uh, will run sequentially or in parallel is going to depend on how many SMs I have in my GPU, right? If I have many SMs in my GPU because I have a very strong GPU that I I pay thousands of dollars for, then maybe these blocks run in parallel. But if I have a small GPU. Uh, that maybe that that you know that uh, you know uh, that's just like sitting there in my laptop managing my screen. That maybe these blocks are more likely to run sequentially. Okay, okay so it does, it does depend on your hardware, and I will talk about that. So how much we serialize depends on how much hardware we have. So it's going to be uh, uh, it's going to be uh, uh, data dependent. Okay, so uh, so let's see how to actually implement this. So what I want to do now is I want to make one thread block responsible for multiple output tiles. Uh, and in other words, I want to make one thread responsible for multiple output elements instead of just one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the thread responsible for this output element also be responsible for this output element over here. Okay, so let's uh, go to the code uh, and uh, write this code. Uh, so I, this is uh, this is the matrix multiplication code that we wrote before. 
uh, the Tag Metro Translation Code worked before. I'm going to compile it uh, and I'm going to run it so you guys uh, can remember how long it took. Here, the kernel time was 0 0.91 milliseconds. Uh, and I'm going to open this kernel code. And you'll notice here's what we did before. We had uh, we declared these shared memory tiles. Uh, we found a row index or column index, initialized our sum to zero. We looped over the tiles and then for, uh, for over the input tiles. And for every input tile, we loaded the tile of A, we loaded the tile of B. Sync threads was make sure that all threads finished loading before any of them start computing. Uh, and then we looped over the, the tiles and computed a partial sum. Uh, and then we did sync threads again to make sure everybody finishes computing before we load the new values. And we keep looping through our input tiles until we're done and restore the results. So this is the code that we wrote last time. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to modify this code in order for me to accomplish this, accomplish this idea that we have one thread block responsible for multiple output tiles. Okay, so to do that, uh, I'm going to start by defining something called my coarsening factor. My coarsening factor is going to be how many units of parallelism is every thread going to be responsible for. Originally, every thread was going to be responsible for one, but I can I want to I, I can I want this to be kind of an arbitrary value. So I'm going to call this coarse factor, uh, and let's just set it to four. So let's say that every thread is going to be responsible for four output elements. And in other words, every thread block is going to be responsible for four horizontally adjacent output tiles. Okay? So what do I need to do now? Well, now uh, row still makes sense because here uh, the uh, that is processing this row, uh, is processing this element, now is processing this element and this element. So, so they both have the same row. So this row variable still makes sense. But this column variable is now a little bit weird because now we don't just have uh, a thread doesn't just have one column. It has a column for each of the elements that it is responsible for. Okay, so I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by finding the, the column index for the first element it's responsible for. And then later on, we will we'll, we'll, we'll proceed to kind of go to the following thread blocks. So now uh, the column index, and I'm not going to call this call anymore. I'm going to call it. Uh, and uh, call start, meaning it's the column index for the first element the thread is responsible for. Uh, and now, what do I have to change in this calculation over here? So now, every thread block is not just responsible for tile dim elements, it's going to be responsible for tile dim elements times the coarsening factor. So here, uh, here uh, the, the thread block is res was responsible before for four elements, now, if I have a coarsening factor of two, the thread block is responsible for eight elements. So to find the first column a thread block is responsible for, I need to have block index dot x times block dim dot x times the coarsening factor. Okay, here I'm gonna have times the coarsening factor. Okay. Okay, so after I put the coarsening factor here, now I know the where every every column starts. Uh, sorry, every where the, the start column for every thread. Okay. The next thing I need to do is I I was initializing sum before, uh, but now every thread actually has multiple sums, right? So now this the thread responsible for this output element is also responsible for this output element. So it, it's going to partially accumulate to this sum and then partially accumulate to this sum. And then it's going to load the next tile of B and the next tile of A, and it's going to partially accumulate to this sum and then to this sum. So now, rather than each thread being responsible for one element, it's responsible for coarse factor elements. So here, sum is no longer going to be a local variable. Sum is going to be an array uh, whose size is coarse factor. Okay. And now I want to initialize each of these to zero. Uh, so what I need to do is I need to loop over for unsigned n c equals zero, c is less than the coarsening factor, plus plus c. Okay, and then over here, I'm going to initialize sum of c to zero. Okay, now I've initialized uh, the sum for all the elements that I'm the thread is responsible for to zero. 
Okay, now what do I do? Now I'm gonna loop over my tiles. So this outer loop over here loops over these input tiles. Now for every input tile, what I need to do is I need to uh, load uh, an input tile A, and then I need to load multiple input tiles for B. Okay, so if we go back to the uh, over here, I need I was loading one input tile of A and one input tile of B, but now I need to load multiple input tiles of B. In order for me to uh, load multiple tiles of B and process them, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to now insert a loop uh, that loops over the tiles of B and then and then does the sum. Okay, so here I load the tile of A. And then I'm going to have a loop that loads a tile of B and then computes, and then loads another tile of B and then computes, and then loads a third tile of B and then computes, etc. Okay, so here what I will do is I will loop over here for unsigned and C equals zero. C is less than the coarsening factor. Okay, plus plus C. Uh, and now what this loop is going to do is going to loop over all this stuff. Okay, so this loop is going to load a tile of B, sync threads, and then do, do the partial sum, and then sync threads, and then load the second tile of B, then do the another uh, partial sum for that, and then sync threads, etc. Okay, but now what I need to do is uh, when I'm loading this tile of B, I'm using the column of the thread. Uh, and uh, I need to make sure to set the column of the thread correctly. Okay, so the thread that's processing this element over here is going to have a column value. When it goes to the next value of C, it's going to have another column value. And when it goes to the next value of C, it's going to have another column value. And that column value is going to depend on C. Okay, uh, so here, uh, what I need to do is I need to figure out for each. Uh, for each uh, value of C, so for each step in the coarsening loop, uh, what column uh, the thread is responsible for? Okay. So to figure out the uh, the column index, I write unsigned int call is equal to, and then I have the column that I started from. So call start. Okay. Uh, so if in when the for the first element first element that value is just going to be call start okay for the for the first court the value of the course factor when c is one that value is going to be call start plus uh, the width of an entire tile okay etc so here uh, we're call start plus the coarsening factor times the width of an entire tile is going to be call start plus C times tiled in. Is that clear? Yes. So, so here this loop, this coarsening loop is going to loop over uh, our different tiles. Okay. And every time it's going to have a different column index and then everything else is going to be the same. So here, when we load from the, from B, it's going to be the same thing, right? All, uh, all this code is still valid. We sync threads. And then we loop over this, and then we multiply the tiles of A with the tile of B, okay? But then here, when we have the sum, okay, the sum over here uh, now is an array. So we need to make sure that we pick the right sum. So it's gonna be sum of C. So now we have a loop that loops over the input tile, and then for every input tile of A, we loop over multiple input tiles of B, okay? Uh, and we compute uh, using those input tiles. Okay. And then finally, uh, when we are done with all of this, uh, now we are we are done. All the sums are ready, but now we have multiple sums that we need to write out. So again, we're going to uh, loop over. Uh, we're going to have this coarsening loop that loops over all our uh, our output uh, values that we need to write out, uh, and we're going to write them out. Okay, but of course, uh, over here, we're gonna need the value of the column. Uh, and here, the value of the column is gonna be calculated in the same way we did it before. It's going to be call start plus C times style of them. Uh, and of course, here we have multiple values of sum, so this is going to be sum of C. Okay. 
So by doing this, what we've done uh, is we've applied thread coarsening to our matrix matrix multiple tile matrix matrix multiplication kernel in order for us to reuse the same tile of A that we loaded for multiple tiles of B. And let's now compile this code. Okay, and now we can run it. Uh, and uh, we have a mismatch. Uh, so let me go and figure out where this mismatch uh, is. Professor, um, yes. you change the block dimension. Yes, thank you. That's that's what I forgot. Uh, so what? So before we when we were loading this, now we uh, we have we had certain number of thread blocks. Now we have to divide this number of thread blocks. By the um, by the block dimensions. So you're absolutely right. That's what we forgot. Uh, we have to change the block dimension. So we're going to come down here in the code that was launching. Okay, and we are. We need to divide the number of thread blocks in the x dimension by the coarsening. Factor. Okay. So once we do that, hopefully that'll work. Okay. And there we go, it worked. So you're right, thank you for uh, that correction. So now you'll see that the time has improved. So before it was 0 0.91 milliseconds, and now it's 0 0.87 milliseconds. Okay, uh, and here the performance improvement is, is okay. You know, we can experiment with different, different coarsening factors. So for example, let's try a, a larger coarsening factor. So maybe we have, uh, rather than four, we can have a factor of 16, you know, and this may, may help performance or may turn performance. Uh, if let's try this, okay, and you'll notice that this time it hurt performance because now we have too much serialization. Okay, so depending on the GPU that you're running on, uh, different coarsening factors uh, may be better or worse. Uh, so this is uh, here the code that we wrote. Uh, so th thread coarsening is basically an optimization where a thread is assigned to multiple units of parallelism. In other words, we make the thread more coarse grain. The advantages of thread coarsening are is that it reduces the price paid for parallelization. In the example we did today, what this did is it reduced the redundant memory loads uh, from the tiled matrix multiplication. But it may reduce other things. We could reduce the redundant computations, for example. So if if multiple blocks do some redundant computation uh, and that's the price we paid for parallelism, then we can do that redundant computation once and then use it for multiple threads. Uh, and also, it could reduce something like synchronization or divergence. So if the price that I paid for parallelization was synchronization or control divergence, then it would reduce that cost for me too. Okay, the disadvantages of thread coarsening are like we saw. So when I increased the thread the coarsening factor from 4 to 16, I actually ended up hurting performance. So under, we may underutilize resources if the coarsening factor is too high. Okay, uh, and what that means is that we need to retune the coarsening factor for every device because different devices have different amounts of resources. So different devices will have different coarsening factors. So I'm no longer benefiting from this transparent scalability because I'm interfering with the transparent scalability when I apply a thread coarsening. So these are the advantages and disadvantages of um, thread coarsening. Another disadvantage of thread coarsening is that uh, we have more resources per thread. So now in our code over here, a thread now is using more resources because it has to, you know, it needs to maintain more, uh, more, uh, uh, more, it needs uh, more values, uh, sorry, more memory here in order for it to uh, store all the partial, different partial results. Okay, so, uh, we need more resources per thread, and if we use too many resources per thread, this may limit occupancy. All right, uh, so uh, having covered that, this is a checklist of the optimizations we've looked at so far, tuning resources to maximize occupancy, uh, minimizing control divergence, having a uniform memory access pattern so that we have memory coalescing, uh, shared memory tiling to capture data reuse, and thread coarsening to, to uh, mitigate the price of parallelization. And this on the left here shows you the impact of each of these optimizations on the cores and on memory. There's one more optimization we didn't talk about yet, and we will talk about it in a few lectures from now, and that's privatization. And privatization is an optimization we'll cover later, but it basically tackles the case when we have cont different threads contending on a common output. Okay, and with this checklist of common optimizations, with these six uh, different optimizations that we have uh, in this list, uh, this covers a wide range of the different optimizations that we cover uh, that we apply when doing GPU computing. 
Uh, and throughout this, uh, throughout kind of in the, in the second part of the course, we're going to go through many different parallel patterns and we're going to paralyze them. And when we paralyze these parallel patterns, we'll, we'll pass by this checklist and we'll see which of these optimizations apply to those parallel patterns. And we'll see how we can apply uh, these, these optimizations in the different contexts. Having said this, uh, it's important to note that sometimes there's a tension between optimizations. So, for example, when I maximize occupancy, Sometimes if my occupancy is too high uh, and, and, and my threads use a lot of memory, the, having too many threads, these threads start competing for the cache and they might evict each other's data out. So, some, so there's a tension between maximizing occupancy, but also controlling uh, the thrashing of my cache. Uh, so sometimes what people like to do is not to maximize occupancy, but you know, try to limit occupancy a little bit uh, in order, if they know that th the threads are thrashing each other's data out of the cache. So sometimes, uh, sometimes you have to kind of uh, make the balance between different optimizations. Another example is shared memory tiling. If I use a lot of shared memory, I, it helps me enable enable more data reuse. But then, if I use too much shared memory, it might limit my occupancy because I don't, this, the SM doesn't have enough shared memory to uh, to fully utilize all the all the threads that it can have scheduled. Uh, another example is thread coarsening, where coarsening reduces redundant work, but it requires more resources. So if I do too much coarsening, I may end up uh, limiting occupancy as well. So it's important for us to find the sweet spot that achieves the best compromise. And also it's important for you to know what your bottleneck is, right? So you need to know what your bottleneck is because you don't want to optimize for the wrong thing. So, uh, uh, so the constraint that limits your performance bottle, uh, the performance of the application is called a bottleneck. And uh, the bottleneck depends on the application as well as the device. Sometimes what might be limiting your, applica your application is uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the data reuse or, or the, the memory bandwidth. Sometimes what might limit your performance is output contention. Sometimes what might limit your performance is occupancy. Sometimes what might, what might limit your performance is control divergence. If control divergence is what's limiting your performance, then you don't want to go apply shared memory tiling. Because, the, because you're tackling the wrong bottleneck. If your performance is limited by control divergence, you want to go and try to minimize the divergence. So it's important uh, when, when we apply optimizations, we trade one resources for another to alleviate the bottleneck. So it's important for us to know what our bottleneck is. Uh, so to properly diagnose our application, uh, our, the bottleneck of our application before we select what optimization to apply. Because if we, if we, if we, um, if we have some bottleneck and we apply a different optimization, uh, we might be optimizing for the wrong resource and we might not get any performance or worse, we might even hurt performance. Okay. Having said that, uh, you can read more about what we covered today in chapter five of the course. Uh, and I'd be happy to take any final questions. Does anybody have any final questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, then that's all for today. I'll see you next week. Bye, everyone.